great to be in the house of the Lord with you all. He is worthy. There is no one like him. And, and we, can, we can trust in him no matter what we're called to face in this life. And sometimes those are some really hard things. But God is faithful and true. Well, welcome. I want to welcome you again. I want to add my welcome to you this morning. And thank you for worshiping King Jesus with us. My name's Chad Henley. I'm the, um, past, one of the pastors here. And we're, we're going through the book of Acts. And this morning we're going to talk about power from on high. Power from on high. But before we do, I'd like to pray for us one more time. So King Jesus, Lord, we're looking to you this morning. Um, we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge, Lord, with uh, with saints and angels, that you are holy. There is no one like you. Open up our eyes and wonder this morning, Lord. You, you have done uh, wonderful, marvelous deeds. They cannot be numbered, Lord. You have um, uh, raised from the dead. You have stopped the mouths of lions. You have split seas. And you're the same God who works and fights for us today. And so, Lord God, help us walk in faith. Help us walk in obedience. Remove, God, any unbelief, God, that may um, linger in our hearts. And help us see you with eyes of faith today, Lord, to, um, to love you, to serve you, to worship you, to render to you all the praise and honor and glory that you're due. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. There should be one in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home that's available to you, uh, we invite you to take that home. That's our gift to you. Also, there's a disciple shelf in the back. If you don't know what a disciple shelf is, it's a bookshelf for your discipleship enjoyment. And um, it's in the lobby there. And There's free books there. And There's also some Bibles there if you'd like one of those. So as we're talking about the book of Acts, we've already seen some major themes in the book uh, that has implications for us for the church of Jesus Christ today, right? Um, Jesus Christ commanded these earliest Christians to be witnesses, we saw, and witnesses to the resurrection. So Jesus is alive. <laughs> that, that, that changes everything, right? They, they saw Jesus alive with their own two eyes, and, and he commanded them, uh, saying, when uh, when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will bear witness to the fact that I am alive to the world because that brute fact, the brute fact that Jesus isn't dead but he's alive changes everything, and you need to go tell people about that. But this task was not something that they could do on their own, and that's what we talked about last time. Uh, last week is we talked about how they were getting ready for the Spirit. They didn't need to get ahead of themselves because the, the work, the task that God had appointed for them was not uh, a, a task that was humanly possible. They needed power from on high. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to enable them to do what they could not do on their own. But when the Spirit comes, they'll receive power to do all that they have been appointed by Christ to do. Uh, the, 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 even though Christ would, would depart from them in body, he would actually, he said, uh, do something better than him being with us physically, uh, with his physical presence, he would put his spirit inside of us. And that would enable us to fulfill the mission that he's called us to do. And we're going to see how that happened this morning as we talk about power from on high, from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. If you're able and willing, uh, let me invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them were hearing them uh, was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, 
Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. And we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. The word of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so we're going to look at this, uh, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit this morning. And there's, there's four things I, I believe we can, we can draw out from this passage um, that we're going to talk about in turn this morning. Number one is we're going to see God's presence revealed. God's presence revealed. Number two, God's power poured out. God's power poured out. Number three, God's people restored. God's people restored. And then number four, God's work rejected. God's work rejected. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is God's presence revealed. God's presence revealed. So as we talked about last time, right, there, there, uh, Jesus has ascended into heaven, and he told them, he said, wait. Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll receive power. And so, so we talked about last time that they had devoted themselves to prayer. They had kind of recommissioned a, a 12th apostle because they needed the full number of the apostolic witnesses in order to fulfill the mission that Jesus had given to them. And so they have been waiting, and then the day of Pentecost comes. So Pentecost means 50, and it's the 50th day after the Jewish Passover, um, and this festival is also referred to in the Bible as the Feast of Weeks or, or the Feast of the First Fruits. And it's another time, of course, um, because there was three major feasts a year when Jerusalem, especially all the males were, were required, were supposed to come into the capital city of Jerusalem and to offer the sacrifices and worship in the Jewish temple. So it's, 50, uh, uh, it's the 50th day after the Passover. Um, and in God's providence, of course, with it being the Feast of the Weeks, it was another, op- it, it was, it, uh, uh, God has appointed clearly that it would be another opportunity where, where many crowds are surging upon the city of Jerusalem. And so many people than normally would would be available and around to hear the message of the gospel when the Holy Spirit would come upon uh, those first Christians. And so, and, and by the way, many of those Christians, crowds would, would have been, by and large, the same crowds who were there 50 days earlier during the Passover. And that's going to come into play later in Peter's sermon, which we're going to talk about next week, where he, tell, where he tells them, you're the ones who crucified Jesus. Okay? And so, so we have these crowds here, and they're gathered, and we have these disciples, and they're praying together. And then all of a sudden, they hear this sound like a mighty rushing wind. Okay? And uh, it, it fills the entire house, and not only did they, they hear something, but they also saw something, right? They saw, you know, it, it's a description. We don't know exactly what it looked like because he, he says it, it was like, you know. He, he, most of the things, they don't know how to describe it. They just, they're doing the best they can. But it was like tongues of fire from heaven came down and like rested on each one of, each one of their heads, right? And it says there that that was symbolic or it was a, a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality that was taking place because at that moment, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they began to speak in other tongues, that is, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them to do, which means that, which means that they weren't all speaking the same languages, but the same language, but, you know, one was speaking this language, another was speaking that language, and so on, all right? And of course, when, when this happens, it says there that the people are amazed, they are bewildered, they are perplexed. It uses all these words to talk about how these pe- like the onlookers can't understand like, what's happening. So how are we to interpret what's going on? Well, the first thing that I think we should notice that, that I, I think is important is that this imagery of, of wind and fire is, is Old Testament imagery of uh, what we would call a theophany, which is just a fancy word meaning a divine appearance, okay, a divine appearance. Uh, The most obvious example of this is Elijah, right? Remember when Elijah had a great victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, but then Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, and so he gets scared and runs, 
all right? And he runs all the way, uh, he runs all the way to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, which is where Moses met God on that mount, on that same mountain, all right, when he received the Ten Commandments, all right, to, to give to the nation of Israel. So now, all these years later, uh, Elijah is on Mount Horeb, and it says there that the Lord came and passed by Elijah on the mountain, right? But what did that look like, right? What does an appearance of God look like? Where it says first that there was, this, there was a mighty wind, right, that broke the rocks, and then there was an earthquake, and then there was fire, and then there was a still small voice, all right? A still small voice, all right? Caught, caught you off guard a little bit, all right? There was a still small voice, right? But what's the point? The point is that that God's presence, God's passing by, was depicted as fire, as wind, and as fire. All right? And so this is, again, this is the Old Testament imagery of a theophany. God himself, uh, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, has come down and has appeared to this beginning nucleus of the church of Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is that, you know, um, for Elijah, right, the wind and the fire, it passed by. But this time, the wind and the fire, and this time in the wind and fire, God wasn't just passing by. This time, God was here to stay. And that's, that's what it says, right? That, that, that tongue of fire came and it rested on each one. It remained on each one. I mean, we, we can read that story like so often and just think, okay, that's cool. The Holy Spirit came. But like the theological import of that is just, I mean, we're, we can hardly describe it, right? Never before in all of the Old Testament, in all the Bible, has the Holy Spirit actually come and rested on people in this way, ever. Right In the Old Testament, the, the Spirit would like rush upon people for, to do some great mighty deed, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't rest on them, it wouldn't stay on them. And here we have every believer of the church of Jesus Christ having the Holy Spirit rest upon them. Folks, that changes things. It changes things. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? God has come to stay. And this is, which is why the Apostle Paul, for example, in Ephesians 2.22 he says, uh, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, right? So now, why don't, you know, Christians, we don't, have a, we don't have a temple, all right? We don't even need a building. I mean, sometimes we think we do. We don't, right? The earliest Christians didn't have a building, right? We don't need those things because God doesn't live in a building. He lives in his people, we are the temple of God, the dwelling place of God by the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says. So God has come to, to live in us, in his people. And so the first thing we see um, from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is God's presence revealed. Number two, we see God's power poured out. God's power poured out. If you look there again in verse 4, it says, They're all filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews from all these places, and uh, th they heard these Christians in the power of the Spirit speaking their native language, their heart language, all right? So if you recall from your Old Testament history, right, uh, Israel uh, came into the promised land through Joshua. There was a period of judges, and then there was a period of kings, right? Right? And you remember that during the period of kings, right, the, the, uh, the, the nation started rebelling against God, started com committing idolatry, okay? The northern kingdom of Israel uh, was conquered by the Assyrians, okay? And then later, the southern kingdom of Judah would later be conquered by the Babylonians, all right? And so, and so after those exiles, after those, those conquerings, Jews became spread, you know, all over the world. The Assyrians exiled the northern Jews. The, uh, the, the Babylonians exiled the, 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 uh, the Judeans. And so these Jews, because of the exile, became spread all over the, 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 the world, the, the known world at that point, okay? And, and so this was called the, the Jewish diaspora. I had to look up how to pronounce that, all right? But it's called the Jewish diaspora. And so it means, it means they were spread out, all right? Now, it's, it's pretty well documented, actually, that 
many of these diaspora Jews who, uh, who were spread out, right, during, during the time of Jesus, many of them moved back to Jerusalem. And so there were, in fact, we know, there were, in fact, many Jews who had, even the, they, they were Jewish, even though they didn't, were, weren't born in the land of Israel, and they eventually moved back to Jerusalem, but they were, they, raised, they were raised and probably lived a good portion of their lives spread out all over the known world at that time, right? So what's the point? The point is, is that even though they probably sp- spoke Greek and Aramaic, which was the local languages, they, their heart language, the language that they were raised in, was, was one of these uh, obscure languages that he lists there from all these different countries. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Cappadocians, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, you know. And so, and so all these diverse languages, right? And when the Spirit falls and the Christians start speaking in the languages of their homeland, of their, of their heart language, and, and, and they're looking, and what do they say? They see these, they see these uh, Galileans. I don't know if you've picked up, but the Galileans just didn't have a great reputation, all right? They, they weren't the best. They weren't the brightest, okay? They're kind of like the rednecks of Israel, all right? And, I mean, it just is what it is. I mean, we're, you know, most, I mean, uh, you know, people call me a redneck. People, people look how, you know, uh, how I look, and then they hear my southern accent. They're like, what happened to you, you know? But it just, it is what it is. It's just, that's just how I talk, because that's where I'm from, all right? So, so, the, so the Galileans were kind of like the Jewish rednecks, and, and, they're, and they're just like, they're just like, how is it that they're speaking, how is it these unlearned, uneducated, untraveled people are speaking these languages that there's no way that they could possibly know how to speak that language, right? And so, in other words, what is happening is a, is a, clear, a clear miracle is being performed, right? God gave these Christians the supernatural ability to speak languages that they had not learned to, to do what? To bear witness of the mighty works of God. And so, that's the most important thing that we should take away from, from what's from What's happening there is it's not, it's not the mere fact that they were speaking in language in, in unlearned languages and, you know, and, you know, people get real excited about tongues and what all that means. I'm not going to try to explain all that today. I'm just going to say that the main point of what is happening here is that they spoke in unlearned languages. It was, and the, the most important thing is what were they saying? It says they were declaring the mighty works of God, and that clearly is talking about the mighty works of God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And so all these people are, are hearing, you know, their heart language spoken, and they're hearing the mighty works of Jesus from these people who have no, knows no way that they could know that language. And so what is it telling them? It's, it's telling them that God has something to tell them. God has miraculously made a way for them to hear in their own heart language something they really need to hear, namely the mighty works of God through Jesus Christ. And so that's what was happening. And so what, what, so what has happened that, well, what Jesus had told them was going to happen, happened. Namely, they received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they became his witnesses, beginning first there in Judea and then to the ends of, of the earth. And so that's what caused those unbelievers, or, or at least some of them, to know that God really was at work because of this miraculous power given to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the, what's the point? The point is, is that the Spirit of God is the power of the church for the mission of the church. That's the point. God will give you and enable you to do anything and everything he wants you to do to be a witness for him. It's not rocket science. God will make it happen. I know when you hear, when you hear stuff like that, like, you know, mo- you all, sometimes you're wondering, like, you know, is that true? You know, because you, know, you hear some crazy things. But I know a person. I know a good, dear brother, a, a, a faithful Christian brother who had an experience similar to this. He was on a mission trip, and he was riding on a bus in a foreign country, okay? And um, I, if I remember correctly, he, 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 he liked to connect with people through, like, magic tricks and stuff like that. Um, and, and so he was, like, he was, like, trying to talk to this, this person all right, and, and maybe there was someone there, I, I, yeah, I think there was someone there who, who, who spoke English, and so he was trying to talk, but there was another person there who didn't speak English, and so he was trying to, like, share the gospel, and then when, when he got done, 
it turns out that in the conversation, the person who didn't speak English could understand every word that he had just said. Why? Because when God wants somebody to hear something, he's going to make a way for them to hear it. And so, like, if you just are faithful and just, like, seize opportunities, you don't, you don't know, like, what God's going to do because God has the Holy Spirit and he's work, God's Holy Spirit is at work in us and through us to do what? To do what the, his main job, and that is to, to bear witness to the glory of his Son and salvation through Jesus Christ. So we see God's presence revealed, we see God's power poured out, and then number three, we see God's people restored. We see God's people restored. So um, if we look at what's happening here from another angle, right, if we zoom out just a little bit to figure out from like a bigger picture perspective what's happening, um, I think there's some interesting things. Uh, different scholars at times have noted that there seems to be a connection with the, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues with the event uh, that happened at the Tower of Babel. Some think, that, some think there's more connection than others, but I think there's, I think there's a connection worth, worth, worth pointing out there. Okay, What happened at the Tower of Babel? Well, if you remember at the Tower of Babel, it's before Abraham and all that even happened, but it's after Noah, all right? So God had literally just judged the world through a flood, okay, the whole world through a flood, and he, 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 there was one family that he preserved because of their faithfulness. That was Noah and his family, okay? And uh, after Noah and them got off the ark, he gave them the same mission, if you will, that he gave Adam and Eve, right? Be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a restart, if you will, for humanity. And then at that time, of course, God promised that he would never judge the world in that way again. Uh, and, and, and he gave the rainbow as a sign of that, right? So the way I interpret that is that uh, it seems to me that, that God's basically saying, you know, I, I'm not giving any more. There's no more reset button. There's no more redos. There's no more do-overs, Okay. Whatever, humanity, whatever kind of mess humanity makes up for themselves from this point, they're going to have to live with it, all right? And so then, not long after Noah comes, th there comes the event of the Tower of Babel. Now, what's happening with the Tower of Babel? Well, you have all these people, and they all speak the same language, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to build a tower to do what? What does the text say? It says to make a name for themselves, all right? So there's pride. All right, they want to make a name for themselves, and they want, it, they, want, they, they want it to reach up into heaven. Well, what is it? It's the, age, it's the, it's the ancient sin and ancient lie of pride, right, that, 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 that does what? That wants to reach heaven without God. That wants to, that wants to be God by reaching heaven without God. All right? It, 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 it's, it's, it's rebellion against God. God commanded them to spread out and multiply and fill the earth, and they're, rather they're congregating in their rebellion against God. Right? So what does God do? God confuses the languages. Why does he confuse the language? So that they can't work together in, you know, in concerted effort in their rebellion against God. Now, if you think about it, that was genius on God's part, right? Because evil... And rebellion divided against itself is better than evil and rebellion concerted in its efforts. Amen? Right? And so God has, God has, God confused the languages so that they wouldn't be able to work together in their evil and their rebellion. But what happens, what's happening here though with, uh, with Pentecost? Well, it's, even though it's not like a complete reversal, what's basically happening is that uh, sin had caused the division of languages, right, to make it challenging and difficult for people to work together in their sin. But now God, by his Holy Spirit, is now allowing the Christians to speak in all these different kinds of languages so that what, so that what sin had divided, God is now reuniting, right? What sin had divided, what, what, what the judgment of God against sin had had separated, God is now bringing back together by allowing people of diverse languages to hear the one and same gospel in their heart language. And so this is, so it's, a, it's kind of a reversal of Babel. And that's one, that's one way that God is restoring, right? He's restoring the world. He's restoring the world from the division from sin 
and he's and he's he's working slowly but surely over time to bring it back to where all the world is once again reunited under the one gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're working towards uh, in the kingdom of God. The second thing that we see in terms of uh, restoring of God's people is that if you read through the Old Testament, and I wish I had more time to kind of walk through to show you how, but if you read through the Old Testament, one of the, one of the clear and obvious signs that was foretold in the Old Testament about, about when God's re- restoration would take place for his people, one of the signs that that would be happening was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One example of that is in Ezekiel chapter 37. You know, you're, you're familiar with that passage, all right? God takes Ezekiel in a vision, and he sees a valley of dry bones, okay? And what does is, what is, um, God say to Ezekiel there in Ezekiel 37? It says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, I will do, and I will do it, declares the Lord. So in Hebrew, uh, the word for breath and the word for spirit is the same word. So when he's talking about the breath coming into them, he's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? That that God would one day restore his people, but how would that restoration come? It would come through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The point is, is that, again, right, these Christians, these first Christians who are receiving the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, they're all Jews, right? Any faithful Christian, any faithful Jew, right, who who knows the Scriptures, if they see something that that is indicating that God is pouring out his Holy Spirit, any Jew would know God's, God's doing something. God is fulfilling his promises to restore his people. But that's exactly what's happening at Pentecost. God is restoring his people. God is fulfilling his ancient promises by pouring out his Holy Spirit and thus bringing his people back to new life. And so that they would finally be able to do what they couldn't do before, and that is love and obey God from the heart. And so what do we see? We see God's presence revealed, his power poured out, his people restored. And then finally, we see God's work rejected. God's work rejected. In, in, in verses 12 and 13 there, it says, all, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. All right, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are always, always going to be two categories of people, right? People who embrace God's rule and the message of Jesus and people who reject it, right? That, that's, that's, that's just basically how it works. There's two, ga- there's two basic categories of people, those who embrace Christ and those who don't, right? And notice here what has happened, the same exact thing that happened during Jesus' ministry, right? Jesus performed all these miracles, all right, undeniable miracles, and you would think, you know, well, if someone saw a miracle, they would just believe in God. Well, that's not how it works, <laughs> Interestingly enough, right? That's not how it works, right? Um, so what's the point? The point is, is that people can see something of God and just think, oh, I, you know, it's, you know that's, a not, that's a cool trick, or, or they're drunk, right? Like, people who don't want to believe in Jesus aren't going to believe in him, and they're always going to have a reason not to, right? But, and so, so they just said that they're, so they say, oh, well, you know, some people were amazed, but then some people said, well, they're drunk. Well, if they're drunk, then they got drunk at 9 in the morning, and they have some problems, all right? So, so, you know, what's happening? Well, you know, the, the, what's the point? The point is this. The point is this. It's always been this way, and, and, and we, we can't let fear of rejection and fear of being ridiculed keep us 
from proclaiming who Jesus is and what he's done. We just can't, right? This has always been the case, and we must be careful because, yeah, because it's hard, because no one likes being rejected, no one likes being ridiculed, but, he, but, but here's the point, right? Jesus was rejected, Jesus was ridiculed, right? If we're not willing to suffer a little rejection and a little ridicule for Jesus, we, the, we can't really call ourselves followers of Christ, because that's who he is. And it also means this. It also means that, that if you're being ridiculed or if you're being rejected for following Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. Now, it, I, I mean, it, it could, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, being, if you're being rude or, about it, you know, that could be a problem. But if you're faithfully following Jesus and things don't seem to get better, for example, or get worse, that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. Jesus lived a perfect life, and they crucified him. And so, and so what does it mean? It means, look, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is the power to bear witness to Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't mean that everyone you talk to is going to get saved, but it does mean this. It means some will. It means some will, right? So when, you, when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, no, not everyone's going to get saved, but some people will. But the only way, the only way, in fact, that, that, the only way, in fact, that, some, that, we, that someone's not going to get saved is if we don't tell them. That's the only way. Because if we're preaching the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, if we just do it, if you sow enough seeds, one of them's going to take root. And so we just keep preaching the gospel. We just keep being faithful. We just do our best to tell others about Jesus in the clearest, most loving, most compelling way that we can. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit's going to move. How do I know that? Because he's been moving for 2,000 years. Why is he going to stop now? Right? If we're serving Jesus, is God going to allow, I just keep saying this, if, if God's going to allow over 2,000 years for the gospel to make it to 1100 Chester Highway, why in the world is it, it going to stop here? Right? So we have a mission. We have a glorious thing to participate in. And yes, some will reject it, but not all people will. So we see God's presence revealed, God's power poured out, God's people restored, and God's work rejected. This is the mission that God has entrusted to us, and we can do it it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Uh, King Jesus, Lord, um, Lord, we're we're amazed by uh, what you did on that day. 2,000 years ago, Lord, when you poured out your Holy Spirit on your followers, Lord, you did something incredible. You did something world-changing, earth-shaking, Lord. You, you poured out the Holy Spirit to the second person of the Trinity to indwell your followers forever. And Lord, I'm, I'm, I would be the chief of sinners, Lord, thinking about how how I fail to live, God, in the power of your Holy Spirit, in bearing bold and faithful and loving and courageous witness to who you are and to what you've done. So, Lord, first and foremost, I ask for your forgiveness. And, Lord, and I ask for us all, God, that, that you would change us, that you would, that you would help us to walk in the fullness of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I know, I know everybody in this room, Everybody in this room, they have someone that they love deeply, Lord, that as far as we can tell right now, won't be in heaven with us. And that breaks our heart. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us courage this morning to know, Lord, to know, to not give up hope and to know, Lord, that you are powerful, that the Holy Spirit is powerful, Lord, and that if we just remain faithful, Lord, And just keep loving and keep proclaiming, Lord. We believe that you have the power to save, Lord, so that we're so that the great desire of our hearts, Lord, to be to to take them to heaven with us, Lord, might be uh, the gift that you would give us through the witness of the gospel, Lord. And Lord, I also acknowledge this morning uh, that maybe there's someone here, God, within the sound of of my words, Lord, and. They don't, they, they don't know. They don't know if they have the Holy Spirit. They don't know if their sins are forgiven. They don't know that if, God forbid, they died right now, if they would be in eternity with you. 
Oh, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that your spirit would reach out to them, convict them of sin, speak to their hearts to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're alive, Lord, that you're coming back, and that you offer forgiveness and, and mercy to all who trust in you. And so, Lord, work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.